Hey guys, this is Nick and here is your Linux, open source and privacy news fix for the end of February 2021. This time we have Linux on Mars, Mint users not doing their updates, slash e-phones shipping to the US and Canada, and a browser extension that makes the web unusable but is still super interesting. Let's take a look right after this. This video is sponsored by Kernel Care Enterprise. Keeping servers safe, compliant, and ensuring constant uptime becomes a full-time job that has to be automated. To do that, you need a live patching tool that integrates with automation tools and vulnerability scanners, that is supported with the latest patches, that lets you decide what patches are rolled out across your organization, and that runs inside the firewall. Kernel Care Enterprise does all of this. It provides you with more integration, more support, and more control. It works in your local infrastructure via ePortal, a dedicated patch server that runs internally but outside your firewall. This server acts as a bridge between internal patch servers and the main kernel care patch server. This approach is ideal for staging and production environments that need strict isolation from external networks or require more stringent control over the patches to be applied. Try kernel care enterprise for free by clicking the link in the description below. Ok, let's start with the Linux news. Ubuntu will make the GNOME shell dark by default in 21.04. The new release of Ubuntu, which should be available in mid-April, won't be using GNOME 40, mostly because the team hasn't had time to really try out the Yaru theme with the new changes that GNOME is offering in the latest version of their desktop environment. Still, they're not going to ship nothing and they are planned to make all the shell elements dark by default. As of today, the top panel is already dark, but when clicking on the date or the indicators, the menus and popovers that are displayed are light themed. But this is going to change, as whatever the theme you picked for your GDK apps, the shell elements will be dark themed, just like in the good old days of Unity. I think it's a change for the better, the system elements did look a bit out of place compared to the rest of the basic Yaru theme. Now a small step for Tux, but a big step for Linux kind, the Perseverance Mars rover has landed on the RAN planet, and it's running Linux. Well, its helicopter drone is, the rover itself still runs a proprietary OS, but it's still the first time that our beloved OS has been on Mars, so that's kind of a historic day. NASA says they wanted to pick a fairly simple platform for their drone, based on a Qualcomm Snapdragon, and as such their proprietary OS didn't have support for it, whereas Linux did, so they went the easy route. It's a nice shout out to the fact that Linux and its open source model does enable a lot of hardware to be used out of the box, including on various CPU architectures including ARM or x86. Now let's hope that Ingenuity, the little helicopter drone, performs as expected and that it will give a good name to Linux for future space missions. Linux Mint's creator, Clem Lefebvre, is calling to all Linux Mint users to actually apply their updates. Looking at Yahoo statistics for Firefox browsing using Linux Mint, he noticed that only 30% of users had an up-to-date Firefox browser. And using other various stats, like the traffic to their various apt repos, he noted that from 5 to 30% of Mint users ran Linux Mint 17, which is end of life and has been for a while. This means that all of these people use an out-of-date distro with no security updates at all. As Clem points out, this number should be 0%. There shouldn't be anyone running an old, outdated version of a distribution. Some of you will be quick to point out that this wouldn't have happened with a rolling release, but that's not true, as this seems to be the result of people just not applying updates at all. In short, if your distro offers updates, apply them. They're here for a reason, and they keep your system secure. GNOME 40 has another blog post under its belt, this time to explain how the reworked activities view will support multi-monitor setups. It seems like the GNOME team has opted to keep it working as it already is in GNOME 3.38, that is, all the workspaces are managed on the primary display and the secondary display hosts its own unique workspace with all the windows that you put on this second monitor. They have crafted a small animated mockup to demo how that works. The team has also added a settings key that lets users have access to all the workspaces on all their displays if they want to. In that case, the primary and secondary displays will all show the same thing, the list of workspaces. The existing keyboard shortcuts will still work to quickly switch workspaces and new ones have been added to reflect the horizontal layout. In short, there is no need to be alarmed about the change, it will work just as well as you were used to. 
Slimbook, the Spain-based computer manufacturer and reseller, has joined the long list of KDE patrons. Slimbook is a company that sells laptops running Linux out of the box, based on generic Clevo or Tongfeng designs, but they also make some nice desktops, one of which I just bought as my new computer and that I'll definitely review on the channel when I receive it. They have joined the likes of Canonical, Suzy or Google as supporters of the KDE project, which will give this desktop environment more resources to run their operations and evolve, so that's a good thing. Now on to some hardware news. The Pine64, the company behind the PinePhone, PineTab, PineTime, as well as the PineBook and PineBook Pro, has announced that the PinePhone will ship with Plasma Mobile pre-installed. The hardware manufacturer decided on a Manjaro ARM base, with Plasma Mobile as the default interface for the PinePhone going forward, although you'll still be able to install anything else you might want to use on your PinePhone. I already did an in-depth review of Fosh, the mobile GNOME shell, and Plasma Mobile on the PinePhone is going to get some love on the channel this month, so stay tuned for that. The Pine64 cites a long working relationship with Plasma Mobile and Manjaro, which have been partners and have supported the project from its beginning, so it's only natural that they would opt for these as the default. Nvidia launched their GeForce RTX 3060, and it has day one Linux support through the proprietary Nvidia driver version 460.56. As always, these cards will probably be swept up by crypto miners and not be super available to the public, even though Nvidia has voluntarily crippled these cards' performance for mining at the driver level in an effort to prevent that situation from happening. It's still nice to see that, even though many people criticize Nvidia for their proprietary drivers and their lack of open source goodwill, they still take the time to support their stuff properly on our platform something that can't really be said of AMD these days, with basically no support for their recent models on launch day. I already talked on the channel about Slash E, the project that aims to provide a de-googled version of Android, and I've been using it for a while now on a Galaxy S9+. Plus. One of the major complaints people had was that they didn't sell refurbished phones with E pre-installed in the US or Canada. Well, that's now fixed. The project can now sell versions of these phones that will work on US or Canadian LTE and 4G networks, and you can now purchase them and get them delivered to you. They are mostly older devices, as support for recent devices demands a lot of work, but if you're not too fussed about using an older and cheaper phone, there are some great options there, including the Fairphone 3. Now on to some gaming news. The XVK 1.8 was released. The DirectX 9 to 11 translation layer that allows many, many Windows games to run on Linux has a few nice improvements, especially one that should prevent devices with an integrated GPU to try and fall back to a CPU rendering method. There is also optimized performance for Intel integrated GPUs and improved stability and performance for DirectX 9 and 11 especially. Many bugs and crashes have also been fixed for Dark Messiah, Formula 1 2018 and 2020, Hitman 3, Nio 2, or Tomb Raider Legend. VKD3D Proton also saw a new release, version 2.2. This library is equivalent to DXVK, but for DirectX 12 games. And while it's mostly a bug fix release, it also lays down the groundwork for more substantial developments in terms of features. This version reverses some hacks that were used to run Cyberpunk 2077 and Death Stranding, since they are not needed anymore, including the infamous VK Valve Mutable Descriptor type Vulkan extension that had been added to make Cyberpunk run. This means that supposedly the game should be playable on Linux on Nvidia cards as well as AMD cards without any crashes. Regressions have also been fixed in Horizon Zero Dawn, and more importantly, support for DirectX ray tracing is starting to be implemented. It's still not usable yet, but the pace of the work is done, so we should soon be able to see RTX enabled, even in DirectX 12 games. Wine 6.3 was released with improved debugger support, the Wine GStreamer library being converted to the PE format, and more WinRT support. 24 bug fixes are also present, including for games such as Monopoly Deluxe, World Rally Championship 4, or Civilization 4. Other non-games programs also saw some love, like iTunes, a bunch of Electron Games launchers, and Steam running in Wine. Now let's move on to the application news. There is a native GDK Spotify client in the works, called Spot. It's built with Rust, and as all third-party Spotify clients, it will need a Spotify Premium account, 
probably something to do with access to the Spotify APIs. It looks good and allows you to use search to find artists, albums or tracks, although looking for playlists isn't supported at the moment. You'll also be able to browse through your existing playlists. It integrates with the system controls for play and pause, next or previous tracks, although it still can't show artwork just yet. The player is obviously in its early stages of development, but it can already be installed through FlatHub. People who aren't big fans of Spotify's pretty heavy Linux client will find a nice alternative in spots better integrated with a Linux desktop. Firefox 86 was released with a few nice improvements under its belt. The first one is the ability to use multiple picture-in-picture -picture windows, so if you want to keep multiple videos on the side of your screen, you now can. It also introduces total cookie protection, which puts each website in its own affectionately named cookie jar, which means that websites have no way to communicate with each other using cookies, so you can't be tracked from website to website. Finally, the printing interface has also been improved and now looks a bit more legible and nicer. If you use Firefox, you probably already have received the update, which annoyingly still asks you to restart the browser if you were using it while updating. Firefox is, in my opinion, one of the best options for privacy-conscious and open-source-loving people, so if you had moved to something else a few years ago, it might be time to give it another shot. And let's complete this video with some privacy news with a new browser extension, which will let you block every website that relies on Big Tech to run. The Big Tech Detective extension needs to be sideloaded onto Firefox or Chrome, as it's not available in the extension stores yet, and maybe never will be. It blocks all websites that reach out to IP addresses owned by Facebook, Google, Microsoft or Amazon. As you might expect, it makes the web completely unusable, as it also blocks websites that call to Google Fonts, for example. Almost every search engine you might want to use was also blocked, including Ecosia, DuckDuckGo or Startpage. Basically, it's a fun experiment to show how much the modern web depends on these companies to actually run since they have made a lot of scripts and resources very accessible and convenient, and they tend to host a lot of the websites on their various cloud platforms as well. It's quite terrifying, actually. And this concludes this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't. You can also subscribe and turn on notifications to get more videos like this one. If you really want to help support the channel and make it grow, you can also join my amazing Patreon subscribers and YouTube members and get access to a weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the video topics I'll cover next month. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!